right okay just checking a few things um hopefully somebody is going to be watching this live but if not that's okay too because i'm going to record these and upload them to my youtube channel and you can watch them later but i thought it would be uh you know convenient for me to do these things live and hopefully convenient for you as well so uh you know hopefully someone's here uh do you in this case i'm i'm directing the stream at my 301 creative coding students primarily but anyone else who's watching you're welcome to watch <laughs> that's the whole idea uh so let's see it doesn't look like anyone's online in discord so maybe you all are planning to watch it later or maybe you're just not online uh that's okay um but i would love for at least one viewer so i know that i'm talking to somebody <laughs> instead of just myself so if you are out there if you could say hi in the chat or on discord that would be great oh i see one viewer nice <laughs> okay um i'm gonna close my door here so i have a little bit more privacy i'll be right back Okay. Although I wonder if the one viewer is me watching myself because I have it set up to do that. I don't, surely it doesn't count yourself if you're watching it. Looks like the bitrate is not amazing. Well, it's getting better now, so hopefully, hopefully you all can see and hear me okay. Well, I'm going to get into some content and then uh, hopefully people will join if they're if they're not already here or if you're watching this later and that's fine too. So today this is the beginning of week two and so what I plan to do in this video is talk about what's coming up in week two, revisit a couple things from week one but mainly talk about week two so that you as a student in this class know what I am expecting from you and I'm and uh, so I can help you get started working on those things and trying to be successful. There is a lot this week potentially, I say potentially because I think any this class especially, but any class, um, there, there always needs to be a bit of flexibility and negotiation in terms of what's possible to accomplish within the, the time frame. And this is the first time I've taught this class as a summer class. Um, so the compressing the timeline that I'm used to, it's, it's been a little bit of a challenge. Um, I say that because I notice uh, most of you still haven't submitted your, your bot assignment from week one. Uh, hopefully, that means you're, hopefully that means you're still working on it. Um, but uh, I haven't really heard, no one's really asked me questions about it. So I hope you're okay. I assume you're okay. I, I put a lot of material into Canvas, kind of walking you through different parts of the process. So hopefully that has helped. Hopefully that's all you need. Uh, but if you need more help, if you want some advice, if you want some feedback, you know, share it in Discord, ask me questions. I'd love to help you figure out how to get your idea complete if, if that's where you still are. So thank you for, thanks for those of you who have submit your, submitted yours. Um, this week there are two big projects and um, I am a little nervous about giving you two projects because of, I, I don't know how you're doing with the first project from last week. Um, I don't care so much if it comes in late, I'm not penalizing you if it comes in late, but I do worry about these things stacking up. So if you are still working on the bot today, uh, it's going to be hard for you to start on the poem and the, the novel uh, today. So. I, let me know how it's going, if things are moving too fast for you, or if you have suggestions. Um, but I'll lay what, out what I have right now, and then we'll see what we can do with it. Right? Um, so this is week two, and I'm still working to create this content. It's essentially, I'm writing out um, like condensed versions of lectures and discussions, and essentially creating a textbook uh, as I go. Um, so it's a lot of work for me, but I, I like doing it. It's something that will be good for me to use in the future, hopefully. Uh, so week two, as you can see here, uh, lots of pages. Several of these past day two are still just placeholder pages, but I plan to fill in those with content as soon as possible, hopefully today. Uh, but I do have content for day one and, of course, the overview. So I'm going to start with the overview and talk about what's coming up in the week ahead. And, um, you know, hopefully this, hopefully this works for you. So uh, two big projects, the novel and the poem. Um, I used to separate these, but I like keeping them together now because they, um, they're similar in, in terms of the workflow and also uh, I'd like for you to use Python for both of these. Um, a quick word about Python. Python is a programming language. I don't expect you to master Python in a week or in two days or whatever. It's something that normally I would spend several weeks scaffolding and helping you kind of build up to a working knowledge of it. So the, uh, the, the Things I'm suggesting you do with Python are hopefully things that you can do pretty um, easily, relatively easily within a week. 
of, of, of learning. Uh, but also I think what I might do is make sort of um, like half completed projects in Python and then give you those and then you can put your ideas into those. So I'll give you several different ways of creating a poem perhaps and then you can choose the one that is the closest to your idea and then uh, adapt it to uh, to be your idea and that's I'm okay with doing that I don't mind doing that I think that's a good way to learn something take something that kind of works and then get the, that kind of does what you want and then make it do what you want that's a good that's how I learned a lot of programming languages so um, I mean I, I'm happy to do that for you all uh, so like for example I'm learning I'm trying to learn R right now I say trying to learn it is a very confusing language to me um, just the structure of it is very different than what I'm used to and I'm struggling a lot, but uh, I have a project I'm trying to do with R, and uh, I've got some code that someone else wrote that kind of works, and so I'm I'm just kind of going through and sort of tweaking and fixing that, and that's helping me learn a lot. So that's that's what I'm hoping helps for you as well. Okay, so here's the assignments. Uh, you've got a poem and you've got a novel. Uh, I'll talk more about those individually. Actually, well, I'll go ahead and talk about them now. I was going to say it later, but I'll go ahead and do it now. So we'll take a look at it. The poem, I would like for you to write po uh, write a program that generates poetry or generates at least one poem and lots of different options for that. I, with the way I've described it here, I might tweak this one requirement, but the basic idea is that you write a self-contained chunk of Python code, a script, and that script will take a file as input and then produce a poem as output. And the input output part, that's definitely something I can handle for you and I, I can write that structure for you. Um, but the choice of which file, the choice of how to turn that file into a poem, that's where your creative work comes in. And so that's something that I will leave up to you and I'll show you how to do that. But like the bot, I think uh, the, the best way to turn this in would be to add this to your GitHub repository, write a readme file discussing what you planned to do with this or what your, your explanation of it is, and then share that folder or li link to that folder in Canvas. So um, I, that's, that, that's, those steps take a little bit of work, so I'll show you how to do those steps as well and probably in, in a video uh, tomorrow. Um, so that's the poem. The novel is actually a little bit more open-ended and the novel, the approach I'm creating here, the, the assignment description is very minimal because it's wide open and that's a good thing and also can be a scary thing. So uh, we'll definitely talk about and practice some things here. Um, but the idea of the novel comes from an event called NanoGenmo or National Novel Generation Month. Uh, this is something that's been happening every November since 2013, something that I've participated in quite a lot and enjoy quite a bit. Uh, that's an event that just any person can contribute, can be part of where you just write code that generates a novel during the month of November. It's based on or really a, a parody of NaNoWriMo or Nano National Novel Writing Month where people like humans try to write a novel during the, that month. So it's a lot of fun and I will show you lots of examples of that. Um, but again, I think uh, I will give you sort of working code that is kind of halfway there and then you can take it the rest of the way to get it there. Um, both of these I'd like for you to use Python. There are plenty of ways to do poetry in other languages, but I think uh, just kind of having Python as a consistent frame of reference will be useful for us. So I'd like for you to use Python and I'll, I will show you what I can uh, with Python. Uh, okay, so uh, additionally, a couple of you have profile assignments this week. Uh, please make sure you do these as soon as you can. Um, obviously, this you know these are differentiated due dates, so some of you have this, some of you don't. Um, what I've done is I've seeded these with just a basic structure. So Jamin, this is yours, and uh, I'd like for you to write a profile of Nick Monfort. Um, you don't have to go crazy overboard with Nick. I mean, he's got uh, a ton of things you can get into, but the idea is just a basic biography, you know, look at his website or Wikipedia page, some of the major stuff he's done, notable awards. Um, you might talk about some of his books, for example. Uh, and then take a closer look at at least one of his works. He's got a lot on his website, uh, nickm.com. So, you know, that's that's something that invites you to take a, a closer look to explain and try to understand what makes Nick Montfort um, interesting and important. Uh, if, you, if you want to look at, uh, let's see if I can click through here. So Lily did a really good job in showing us how to do a, a profile. So check, definitely check this, everyone should check this out, but also uh, check this out as an example of how to do this. So this is uh, Darius Kazemi, um, uh, mastermind of Twitter bots, also mastermind of Nano Genmo, uh, coincidentally. Uh, it, so take a look, lots of great links here, um, lots of good information, and then a closer look at one of these works. So Lily, excellent work. Thank you for getting that started and, and showing us how it's done. 
Um, so I'm also, I'm working on one. I was, I will still do one, but I was planning to do one like this to show you all how to do this. Um, but I still will do one for uh, a poet I've kind of discovered sort of recently, uh, Lillian Yvonne Bertram. Uh, I'm gonna do a profile of her because she's a really interesting digital poet who I just um, connected with pretty recently. So yeah, so that's, uh, that's those are your big assignments, the novel and the poem and the profile for a couple of you. Um, all of you also have to do the weekly reflection and report, and this is something that you do after everything else where you summarize what you did, and that's um, your chance to be accountable for what you've done and, and maybe things that you have not done yet or are still working on or are just not going to be able to do. Um, so that will include the assignments, but also there are other things, other expectations for this class that aren't just doing the assignments. Um, I would like for you to participate in discussions and also to use the, the Discord community as an opportunity to give each other and uh, to, to get and give feedback on your projects. So let me talk about a couple of these other things here. Um, so for discussions, I'm probably going to do one in Canvas like I did for last week. Um, I don't have that yet, but I do already have the one for Discord. So let me show you what I'd like for you to do in Discord. So uh, in a moment, I'm going to talk a little bit about historical digital poetry. I would like for you to go out and discover some as well. There's a lot. Uh, if you look at this book here, this is a book that's available in uh, through Canvas, but it's, it's available for free through our library, uh, much like uh, Charles Hartman's book. Uh, this is a book by a guy named Chris Funkhauser, and it's a history of, or a prehistory of digital poetry. And I'm going to pull it up here and show you what I'd like for you to do with it. You can read it online for free. Um, well, we, we can. <laughs> in this book, it's a history, and it really is um, encyclopedic in structure. And so it's a good introduction to lots of these works and a close analysis of some of them. Um, but what's really useful is, like the introduction essay is really good, um, but the uh, for our purposes, uh, just to kind of dip into this and get something out of it quickly, the chronology of works in digital poetry is a really good introduction to digital poetry. So what I would like for you to do is uh, click into this book, and you saw how I did it here, but you can find this too. And this is the timeline. So it starts in 1959 with Stochastische Texte. I hope I'm pronouncing that right. It's German. Stochastic text is the other, uh, is the English translation. Um, and then there's a chronology of lots of works. There are others, I mean, others that as... Funkhauser notes in this introduction comment here, there's certainly others that he didn't include and others that just are still being discovered. A lot of times people were messing around with computers in the 1950s, 60s, 70s, and didn't think to tell anybody about what they were doing, or they published it in, in some really obscure journals. So these things are still being discovered, which I think is really uh, fascinating and fun. Uh, but some of these are really uh, important in terms of influencing ideas that came later, and also in terms of giving us ideas that we can implement in code today. So things that were very challenging to implement in code in the 1960s because of the limitations of computers turn out to be pretty easy to implement, relatively speaking, in, let's say, Python. So uh, take a look. I, I'm focusing on three of these in my notes, but there's lots of others here. See if you can find a copy of these poems uh, online, perhaps even uh, like a video of them being performed. Um, in some cases, you'll be able to find interactive simulations of these online. So just kind of look, skim through these, find one that you think is sort of interesting, and uh, and see what you can find out about it. And then tell us about that in Discord. So if you find a, a link to it, if you find um, a simulation or a copy of it or a demonstration, link to that in Discord and talk about why you find that interesting, like why you chose that one. Uh, and that would be great. So you can just do that in our main Discord channel, the general channel, if you want. Um, but you know, there's lots of others out there, but these are all good starting points. This goes up into the 1990s, I guess. So really a ton of things uh, available for you to try to discover. And a lot of these, especially in the 1990s, you'll be able to find emulations of these on online. So see what you can find and share it. Uh, this is not a graded assignment per se, but I do want you to do it because things like this help me know that you're following along. Like they help me know that you're getting what I'm, I'm putting out here. And if you're not getting what I'm putting it out, then I need to know that so that I can put it out differently or modulate the instructions somehow. This forms the same, uh, performs the same role as a quiz might. You know, if I, if I give you a quiz, I can ask you a few questions, and if you can answer those questions, that determines that, or that hopefully gives me the idea that you know what I'm asking you to learn. It helps me understand that. So it's really useful information for me. I don't want to do quizzes. I'm not going to do quizzes for this class. But I'm just kind of pointing that out as the pedagogical role of this kind of thing. Like I want to 
I, I want you to discover these, these things, but also I want to know that you are following what I'm saying. So, so please do this. Um, as soon as possible, like you know, today ideally. Um, I will, with the pages in this module, I'm going to, several of them are still in progress, so I'm going to continue uh, adding to them and updating them. Whenever I edit a page in Canvas, there's a little box I can check to say notify that the content has changed. So I'll do that when they're, when they're done. So uh, check that out. And I'll also, I may send announcements as well. So pay attention to the information coming from me through Canvas. Okay, so let me go back home here. Uh, all this, by the way, I've structured it in modules so that I can put it in here sequentially. And that's the intention is that you work through these in this order. But, you know, once it's all done, you'll be able to, to jump around to whatever. Uh, you know, so here's the poem assignment. Here's the novel assignment. Uh, and But as you're looking at a specific page, you can go from one page to the next in an order that hopefully, hopefully makes sense and hopefully helps you process these things. Uh, Okay, so let's talk about digital poetry. The ideas of digital, digital poetry, uh, I think what we should really think about are uh, what does a computer add to the poetic process? Like if we're a poet, why do we need a poem? Or what, uh, sorry, if we're a poet, why do we need a computer? What can a computer add to what we're already trying to do as a, as a writer? And um, lots of poets have thought about this in different ways. And I thought these three would be good to start with to see difference different approaches, but also start seeing what's unique about computation or how computation adds something pretty important. Also, these are just three really cool examples. So I think they're, they're a good way to introduce you to that world. So the first one actually does not need a computer. Uh, it's, and it was not produced with a computer, but it is thinking along the same lines. So this is by a French poet named Raymond Cano. Uh, he created this work called 100,000 Billion Poems. Um, I've linked to the Wikipedia page in a few cases because Wikipedia is great at providing a good overview. I'm doing an overview here, but it, it, Wikipedia adds more sometimes, and it's good to have multiple overviews. Uh, and this is a picture of a physical edition of Cano's book. It's, um, you can kind of see it. It's hard to, to see, but it's sliced. So each, uh, each page is sliced into 14 slices. Each line of each sonnet is sliced in such a way that you can flip the slices as miniature pages and then construct uh, your own sonnet as you as you go. So it's really a the book is really a poem generator more so than a poem, and it's capable of generating um, this many. <laughs> I don't know if that's exactly hundred thousand billion, but it's ten to the fourteenth power uh, possible sonnets. And uh, what I love about that is the idea that, like, I don't know if any of them are good, and it's very difficult to determine that because the majority of these will never be read by humans, even if we all tried. Like, even if all of us tried to read all of these poems, uh, we would still take you know, hundreds of years to get to all of them. So it's something that uh, is fascinating because of that potential. It's just this thing that's out there. Um, it's also really interesting because it demonstrates how how quickly you can get like using geometric math like you can get a very very large a very very an astronomically large work uh, relatively with relative brevity in terms of what you actually write what matters is the, the concept and getting that concept means you can make this huge expansive work um, so it's fascinating and I think uh, it's, a, it's a good example of what you can do with computers so Raymond Cano would go on to found a group called the ULIPO, or the, uh, it's an acronym in French, but it's the Organization for Potential Literature. And he and that group would produce lots of works that were works themselves, but also works for generating works or ways for making new literature. Like that was, that was the idea, to take the writer out of the process as much as possible. So you would end up with works like this, uh, works like, um, uh, uh, void by Georges Perec. Uh, so it's like the, the, the words a void, uh, which also puns on a void. And that's a work where he created a rule for himself that uh, it's called a lipogram, where he would not use any words that contained the letter E. And then he wrote a novel composed entirely of words that do not contain the letter E. That was written in French. E is the most common letter in French. It's also the most common letter in English. And so it was very difficult for him to write that. It was also very difficult for I forget who translated it, but for the, the translator who translated it into English, um, made this book, uh, this novel that does not ha contain the letter E, and it's fascinating. It's a mystery. It's like a whodunit kind of mystery, um, you know, looking for the letter E, I guess. It's fascinating. So that kind of thing. Um, another thing they did was the uh, N plus seven technique, where you take a work and then you replace every noun 
with the word that comes seven entries later in the dictionary, uh, and then you produce a new work that way. And that, that can be a nice um, deconstructive kind of um, parodic approach. So that's uh, that's 100,000 billion poems. You can read it online. Uh, there's a couple different implementations of it, but it's not something that needs a computer uh, to work. And um, yeah, you can see here it is. I, just, I mean, I've read a few of it. I I doubt there's anything super brilliant out there that's undiscovered, just because you can kind of see it all just by reading the 10 sonnets, and you can um, appreciate that scope just by reading that. It's It's kind of surrealistic like it's kind of it's not quite nonsense but it's something that it's hard to really connect with emotionally i find um this one though is different and it's similarly mathematical though uh, this is a work by brian geisen and uh, ian somerville who was the mathematician and they helped uh, they they produced this work uh, really a series of works using this idea of permutation so the first one that i've got an excerpt here from is kick that habit man that one is a later one, I think. The first one they published, I believe, was in 1960, which was I am that I am. Uh, but there's a whole series of these. And all they do is they take an initial phrase, and it's like, you kick that habit man, and then you, it permutates through every possible sequencing of those four words. So as you see here, this is an excerpt, kick that habit man, kick that man habit, kick habit that man, kick habit man that. And you can hear as I read it, you're tendency you can't avoid is is creating different inflections to create different meanings out of that. There's no punctuation, so uh, we have to kind of make it up as we go, but we do make it up. Uh, we, it, it is impossible to read this monotonously and without inflection to try to make it sound like something. Uh, and usually in a face-to-face -face class, I, I ask students to do this. Um, I can't do that now, but um, you know, you heard me try it just then. Uh, there is an implementation of this on um, Nick Monfort's website, someone also made a Twitter bot, I made a Twitter bot of it, um, and for my Twitter bot I added new phrases, and it goes through, it's, it takes about a day and a half for each phrase, I think. That of knowing the wake of, I don't remember this one. <laughs> I made up several of these. Um, that's not, but you can see it just tweets each line one at a time as it goes. Um, but there's also, Nick Monfort has created a JavaScript version that is nice because you can actually edit it and make it your own. And I'll show you how to do that in a moment. Um, but you can see this is the full text of Kick That Habit Man. No punctuation and reading it out loud is definitely a challenge. I, I really recommend that you try that uh, to someone else ideally. But if not to someone else, just by yourself in your room or outside or whatever. Uh, it's really challenging. Uh, once you get about a third of the way through, you you feel you feel the struggle. Like You feel like it's just physically difficult to, to carry on almost. Um, but you are forcing yourself to, and you're forcing yourself into creating some kinds of meaning with your voice. And after a while, meaning completely evaporates and it just becomes sounds. And it's a really uh, fascinating, uh, almost meditative experience. Um, so you can hear recordings of, of Brian Geisen reading several of these. Here's a link to uh, a YouTube video of him. It's actually the, just like a still image, but the audio is, is him reading several of, it, of these poems. And really fascinating because he's very expressive as he reads these. Uh, I have a hard time being that expressive as I read them, but uh, I do my best. Uh, okay, so I forgot, I just realized I forgot to switch my segment over. I have these little things here where I can make, make the next segment. I am talking about digital poetry now, so this is, this is, this is the Chiron for that section. Uh, I have a third for today. So this is uh, th this is House of Dust, and House of Dust is also, uh, I think, very accessible. Like it's something that you can read and get and even relate to emotionally uh, without really having to think too much about the programming. This is uh, a quote. This is a few stanzas. Um, I forget how many stanzas off the top of my head. I think it's something like twenty-six thousand possible stanzas that it can produce. Uh, I can it. The, the question has to do with how many different options there are in these different placeholders. But this is a sample of three stanzas. A house of leaves in southern France using candles inhabited by various birds and fishes. A house of brick in a hot climate using candles inhabited by collectors of all types. A house of stone in Japan using candles inhabited by American Indians. And it goes on like this. And it's a Mad Lib style replacement 
grammar. So you have a house of, in, using, inhabited by, these are pre-written, and then the template is filled in at each of these points with a list. So as the program runs, it starts off, it prints a house of, and then it selects a building material from a list of potential building materials. Uh, in, and then it selects a location from a list of locations, and then using a light source inhabited by people. So it's, a, it's something you can look at the source code and appreciate all the possibilities, but watching it run, I think, is a much different experience. Um, I've got a simulator of it where I've done a couple of things to make it kind of print at something like the original speed if you were to have actually run this on, in a, uh, on a mainframe computer as Allison Knowles and James Tenney did in 1967. This is kind of like what it might have looked like as it printed out. I've also set this up so you can share these on Twitter if you want to. I don't know if that still works, honestly. That was a few years ago that I made this. But you can see it printing out and you can see it go like this. Um, that indentation is how, how it was stylized. What I really like about House of Dust is that you do have that sense of scope and mag magnitude or scale or whatever from uh, that, you, that you also see from 100,000 billion poems and uh, permutations. But you also have immediacy and situational specificity. So we can imagine what a house of straw would be like underwater using electricity. It's a almost surrealistic kind of thing, but it is a thing. Like we live in houses, we know houses, and so that idea of dwelling immediately anchors us in a situation and then uses surprising juxtapositions to create a, a poetic effect. Um, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't, um, but that idea that it can work is fascinating to me. Um, a house of mud underwater using all available lighting inhabited by people who sleep almost all the time. So that's a really haunting image uh, to me, like I can sort of suggest almost a magical realist kind of story built around that house. A house of discarded clothing. Uh, what's that like? Um, almost think of like kids tunneling under the laundry or something and making some, pretending that it's a house. Uh, among high mountains, using candles, uh, inhabited by friends and enemies. And yeah, that's, see, that's another really powerful image to me. Um, uh, because thinking of kids tunneling through laundry and playing like in the high mountains, uh, inhabited by their friends and their enemies. Um, I have children, and it is fascinating to me how their friends are also enemies in a lot of ways. They're always, you know, playing together, but their play is often competitive, and they get frustrated with each other. And so with this idea of, like, who's on what side is something that happens all the time. And it's uh, I can sort of imagine that kind of scenario. All of that's suggested by these little uh, randomly chosen juxtapositions. And this is why I really like this poem and why I, I was led to create this uh, simulation of it. Uh, someone did make a Twitter bot of it as well. And Nick Montford also has an implementation of it. And also you can have a, um, there's a video here. Hopefully it looks a little strange. I don't, let me make sure this video is the right link. Um, oh yeah, so it's, I linked to the place in the video where she starts doing this. But this is Allison Knowles, uh, I'm not going to play it now, but this is Allison Knowles reading, um, reading from House of Dust at the White House um, back in 2011. So uh, she's a really fascinating poet. I, um, she doesn't do a lot with computers anymore, but she does uh, did a lot of uh, performative work. And um, so one of the other poems that she reads in that read in that video there is called uh, "Shoes of Your Choice," I think. And the poem is uh, something you make up on the spot if you give a reading of it. You just take your shoes off, put them on a podium, and then talk about them for as long as you feel like. And it's really, it sounds kind of dumb when you say it like that, but watching her perform it, you can kind of understand what, what's so uh, intimate and impressive about it. So I really recommend that you watch that whole video uh, if possible. She also has um, uh, Make a Salad is another poem of hers, uh, and that's, that's the entire poem, Make a Salad. <laughs> but performing it is fascinating because that's what you do. You literally make a salad uh, with everyone there. Like you all, they all make a salad together. It's, it's just great, it's fun. Um, so these are all meant to be examples of the kinds of things that you might be able to do. And as I'm talking about them, hopefully you've kind of seen how you might be able to do this. So for uh, House of Dust, it's really just writing a list and then writing code that selects an item from a list and then plugging that selection into a template. So kind of three steps in that. Uh, you can do it in different programming languages, but that's the basic structure of it. Um, permutation, honestly, is hard to do mathematically. Like I, have, I struggle with the math, but there are lots of libraries that can do permutation for you. So that's usually what I would do. Um, for 100,000 billion poems, it's meant to be interactive, so you really do need to build something like that. But doing something randomly that just picked a random line 
from 14 lines, that would be relatively straightforward to pick. It'd be kind of like programming for a house of dust where you'd say pick one from this list, one from this list, one from this list, one from this list, and then you know keep going uh, as long as you need it to. And you can make um, essentially infinite variations. Okay, so those are just a few brief introductions uh, at this point. Now I'd like for you to go find some more and share them. Um, but also I want to suggest that you could um, you could try it out yourself. And so let me show you what I'd like for you to, I mean, you don't have to honestly do this, but wait, why is this? Hang on. My, my third um, Chiron is in a weird place, uh, but that's okay. I'm going to actually switch over to this screen to do it. Uh, so I want to show you how you can follow my suggestion. This is, an, is not a requirement, but it is a suggestion to help you understand what kinds of things you can do. Um, and to understand what uh, the permutation poem is actually doing. So uh, take a look at it. I mean, actually, I'll just move too many windows. I'll just pull it up this way. So nickm.com. And then he's got several of these older works that he's implemented in JavaScript. So it's nice. Uh, it's convenient for us, right? So uh, permutation poems. And this is the example, Kick That Habit Man. And what he su suggests over here on the right is that you can make your own versions of this. Like you can use one of Brian Geisen's examples, or you can make up your own using the code that's on this web page. So I want to show you how. To, excuse me. I want to show you how to do that. This gets into a little bit of code. This is JavaScript, not Python, um, but it really doesn't matter, as you'll see. We're not. I'm not really going to be writing code as I do this. I'm going to be changing data instead of code. So what he says is to save this, and so I'm going to go ahead and save this page. Um, for OBS, I don't think OBS is actually picking up my windows here, but I'm just right click, save as. Um, if you have an option, if it says to save as plain text or web page complete, uh, I'd say save it as uh, either text files. Yeah, save it as text files or plain text or something, whatever the option is, but make sure that the file name ends in .html. Um, you can change that later, but um, that's something to do that I, I unfortunately can't show you what I'm doing. Uh, but you, you pay attention to how your computer saves this because it's HTML and it needs to be plain text HTML. So not rich text at all. Um, and this is over here on the left. This is a text editor I like to use called Sublime Text. Um, you can do this with any text editor, but it has to be a, a text editor, not something like, uh, not something like uh, Microsoft Word. Um, so I'm going to just open this here and show you what to do. If anyone's watching, you can suggest things, by the way, um, for what I can do with this, but I'll, I'll show you how to do it anyway. All right, so this is the source code that produces this. Uh, oh, no, it's just not the source code. Let me see. That's not the right version. Let me see. I need to try that again. That's not source code. That is the content for some reason. So let me try. There it is. Okay, so <laughs> this is the right version. And this is source code. This is HTML. We're not technically doing HTML in this class except that as you see here it's you know it is relatively easy to read html in the sense that it's just sort it's source code it's plain text but you know we can we can actually manipulate any parts of that but the only part that we really need to change to make a new poem is right here and this is what he's saying when he says edit the words list and then you've got a new poem so kick that habit man is the one that starts with let's change this out to one of the other examples so i am that I. And this, by the way, is the same list syntax that uh, Tracery uses. So I just have to make sure that each item is separated by commas and in quotes. So if I want to do I am that I am, I had to add another item to the list, but that should work fine. And now in my web browser, this is Nick's version and I'll host it on his web page. I'm going to open my own page. And you can see that it just goes ahead and instantly renders that entire poem. And now we have it here. See, it's quite long. Um, with five items in the list, it's going to be 120 lines long, so it's already quite a bit longer. Uh, I am that I am. I am that am I. I am I that I am. I am I am that. I am am that I. <laughs> I this, I'm starting to do the thing. I'm starting to struggle with the inflections. Uh, so, but try out your own ideas. Think of something else, like a, a four or five. I mean, you can go longer, but I wouldn't recommend it. Um, word, four or five word poem that could be permutated um, uh, as many times as you can. Uh, you can also change it. I don't know if this will actually all caps it. Let me see. It might just print it in all caps anyway. All 
right, so here I actually have to escape that quote. If you run into this problem here, you might have it as well. So I don't know if you saw what I did, but um, I wanted to use a single quote mark here as an apostrophe for the word don't. And I had to uh, put a backslash in front of it so that it would not be considered the end of that particular word. Um, syntax question. Okay, good. Yeah, so it did not actually capitalize those automatically. I, I kind of prefer them capitalized, but um, no poets don't own words. No poets don't words own. No poets own don't words. No poets own words don't. And again, you can see the inflection changes the meaning. Uh, but let's see, there might be some other phrases we could try. Okay, good habit, man. Level is recalling. All active agents. Pretty sure he used re as a separate word in this one. This is another of Brian Geisman's recalling all active agents, recalling all agents, active, recalling all active all agents. And you could do it different ways. But again, that's 120. The video that I linked to starts with this one. And he reads it and it's edited, so it sounds like he's reading a bunch of these all at once. It's pretty interesting. Um, yeah, so that's the permutation problem. If you feel like trying this out, that would be great. You can share the, the product of your effort if you come up with your own. And if you're really up to a challenge, you can even try to read it or read one of Brian Geisen's, you know, maybe one of the shorter ones, but record yourself reading it and share it in Discord. That would be great to hear you all try that. Um, like I said, just, just trying it yourself is, is a challenge and I strongly recommend you at least try it, at least privately, and, uh, and then share it if you're brave. Right, that's the that's the thing. I, I just shared a little bit of my my reading of this, um, but I think that's that's probably uh, good enough. So that's that's the introduction to digital poetry. Now um, there are a couple other things that I want to do today that I'm going to be recording today. Uh, I want to I'm going to record a general introduction of Python, a general introduction to Colab notebooks, and a um, maybe an introduction another introduction to the assignment so that I can put those as separate videos on those pages so let me go back here a little bit and talk about about those things here and here now uh, somewhat and then um, you know like I said I'll record separate videos for those so again like I've said this is the the module structure so kind of clicking through it um, I'd say a little bit here about Python here this is something that I recommend as a General, a very general overview to Python, but I'll add a video version of this as well uh, once I've recorded it. Uh, but this just gives you a very, very basic idea of what Python is. Python is a programming language. It's also software. So it's when you're writing the, in the language of Python, you send those instructions to the Python program, which compiles those instructions and then does whatever you've told it to do. So you're basically giving instructions to your computer. Um, that's what programming is. That's what we're doing here. And you've done a little bit of programming with your Tbots code, but that was creating uh, creating data, essentially. Uh, now we're actually going to be creating step-by-step -step instructions. So it is a little different in terms of what kind of thing we're doing with Python. But Python is widely used. It's very useful. Um, you know, we're doing this in a creative context here, but Python is used widely in all kinds of industries, and it's just useful to know. Um, it's also useful to know how programming languages work. Uh, coding languages like HTML, CSS are also good. Um, those are markup languages and they're good, uh, but an instructional kind of step-by-step -step algorithmic kind of language like Python is a good thing to, to, to help understand what kinds of things are possible with code and, and uh, start to understand what people mean when they say things like um, they have an algorithm for solving problems. Uh, I think we need to be critical of things like that and understanding how algorithms work helps us do that. But anyway, um, just some very basics here and I, you know, I can't get into too much, but uh, the idea of Python, you're, you're writing instructions, and so this is an example of a Python expression or instruction. I'm saying, Python, I would like for you to remember this thing called my name, and for now, this thing called my name is Zach. And so every time I refer to my name later on, I would like for you to know that I mean Zach. Um, I might change that at some point, um, but for now, we're going to call that Zach. So later, when I ask you to print my name, it's going to print whatever the current value is of Python. So that's really, you know, that's really what you're doing when you write Python. Um, a lot of times... There's, well, I'm not going to get into this now, but I'll, I'll do a whole video about it. But basically, there's three-ish, three-ish ways that people use Python or can be used. Python can be used. Uh, this is what Python looks like when you run it in a command line. It, it'll 
you type the word Python and then it starts the Python interpreter, which is this, and then you can type things into it. You can type Python code and give it instructions one at a time. Uh, that's a good way for to do quick things with Python, I found. The other way that people do Python is by writing script files, which is a whole list of instructions altogether. And I actually have a couple of these up here. Maybe I can just show you briefly what this looks like. Um, do I? Yeah, I'm already up. Yeah, okay. Well, forget this part, but why is that still showing up there? Hang on. Okay, so uh, this is a Python script. This is something I'm working on right now. I didn't write this particular code, but I'm I'm tweaking it a bit. And it's a, a list of instructions. It's, it's running in Python. So whenever I want these instructions to execute, I say Python, go through this file and do what it says. And what it's doing here is actually, uh, this is searching Twitter and saving the results of those, those searches. So um, that's a, a common thing that people do with, uh, with Python. So that's, that's the way I usually write Python. The other way that we're going to be doing, what I'm going to be using to teach you about Python is going to be using something called collaboratory notebooks. And that's kind of the third way, and it's a good way to learn, especially. So I'm going to go to the next page and show you a couple things about, um, about Python notebooks in Colab. So Python, the notebook concept is something that predates Colab. Colab is just an implementation of the Python notebook way of doing things. Uh, a lot of times people do that on their own computer with something called Jupyter, or it used to be called IPython. And it's a really useful framework for uh, creating code and also explaining what you're doing and helping people learn what you're doing and also sharing projects. So this is an example of a collaboratory notebook. This is the one that Google or the, the team that makes collaboratory has produced to explain what collaboratory is. So this is an actual working Python notebook in Google collaboratory. So you can get started a few ways, but um, usually it's just file new notebook. Uh, but as you see here, it, maybe you can recognize from the, the imagery at the top here, this is working in Google Drive. So what's really nice about this is that if you have a Google account, you can just do this. You can just create a Google collaboratory project. Um, otherwise, you would have to download Jupyter Notebooks and set that up and run that as a server on your own computer. It's doable, certainly. I mean, I have it set up. It's not, it's not actually that hard to set up, but it can be. And, it, and it's not so much difficulty in terms of the steps you follow, but... Um, I found for some people's computers, they have to download a compiler and it's just like too much, right? It's too many steps. And uh, I like this because it's just here and it's all ready to go. So this is a place where I can write code and I can, it can be Python. I can share my code with you and that's what I intend to do uh, to give you some examples for these projects. But here's, here's Python, right? So like I did earlier, my name, I should probably spell it right, equals back. And then in this environment, you can click the play button or you can hit shift enter. Uh, to um, to run that that um, cell of code, and as it runs, you hopefully saw it doing this thing. It connects to a computer, so it connects to a backend that's a uh, a virtual computer somewhere on Google's server farms, and it's running Python for me. And so I just am asking it's Python to execute this code and then give me the response. That's really nice. I mean, in other words, I didn't have to install Python on my own computer. It's running through a web browser to a cloud-hosted computer. Very convenient. Um, also, what's convenient about that is you can switch the runtime, which is the type of computer. You don't need to do this, but just uh, you should know that it's possible. Uh, you can actually change this to be a much more powerful computer using a GPU or a TPU to uh, do really heavy processing if you're doing like machine learning, artificial intelligence kind of things. Uh, that's what you need for those, and so that's you can do that through Google. Um, they're they're pretty good. Uh, you, they are limited in certain ways in terms of how long you can process things. Sometimes machine learning things, even with a high-powered uh, GPU, may take several days to complete a, pro a particular problem. And I have found it's difficult to keep something like one of these things running for more than like 12 hours. But that's been, you know, you won't you won't need to do that for this this week. I uh, remember, so I said my name is Zach, and then so if I wanted to have it print the contents of that file, I mean of that variable, printing my name, Zach, and we can change this out here and it'll change everywhere else my name is referred to. So if you wanted to change this name to George, uh, now it's going to run that as George. Now I, I'm in the habit of just doing shift enter so you didn't see what I did there, uh, but you can also just click play and it'll play that. It'll go through those steps. 
So that was Python in Collaborative Tutorial Notebooks. I know that was very quick, and I intend to make slightly longer videos, uh, standalone videos that I can link you directly to if you have questions about either of these. But back on the Python page, there are lots of other ways you can learn Python, and I recommend them to you. Um, I, you don't really, like I said at the outset of this video, you don't have to get super into Python to be successful this week with the project this week. I'm not expecting a high level Python knowledge. But sometimes you might have a particular a question about how to do something specific. And W3Schools and LearnPython.org are both good for that. Um, because if you have, if you, if you know how to phrase the question, like if you know what you're looking for, you can probably find it here. Uh, if you're not sure what you're looking for, you can try Google and DuckDuckGo or whatever search engine you like, and you can usually get to that that way. Um, but uh, if you also just want to start at the beginning and work your, your way through step by step, uh, Codecademy, I'm pretty sure, has a Python lesson. Um, I have not actually been able to, I haven't tried it out, so I don't know how good it is. But um, what's nice about learnpython.org is you have live Python here. This is something, uh, I'm not sure if this is using, I'm not sure what system this is using, but it's, it's, it embeds little Python snippets that you can run. And it looks like kind of like the back and forth that you get from the collab notebook thing. So if you wanted to have it print, my name is Zach. You could have it do that, just clicking the, the run button. Okay, so that's the idea. And it can take, take you through it. So even with more complicated examples, you can see see the code there and then, then try it. Like you can see, like, oh, I want to do something with strings. Let's see. Here's some stuff with strings. Right. There's actually nothing that, that should happen here. This is just saving those strings and then using them later. So I like learnpython.org for kind of one at a time uh, lessons and things. Okay, so still at one viewer. So whoever that is, possibly me. Um, if you have any questions, let me know. And otherwise, I will be wrapping up soon. And for everyone else, I, you can hopefully watch this later. Uh, the nice thing, by the way, about watching these later, as I hope you discovered, is that you can play these back at whatever speed. So if you're in a hurry, you want to play at double speed, doesn't hurt my feelings, it's fine. Um, but also you can pause and look at specific things if you have a particular question. So um, I said this at the outset, but I will say it again now at the end to wrap up. Your review for the week. You've got a poem, you've got a novel. Uh, a couple of you have profile assignments due. All of you have the weekly reflection due. Um, you also should, uh, of course, watch this video and the, any other videos I put out and uh, complete the Discord activity here. So this is the Discovering Digital Poetry activity. Try to complete that today if possible. Today is Monday. Uh, see what you can do with that. All right, so thank you for submitting what you have already. I will also be grading those hopefully today, uh, possibly tomorrow. I have a paper due tomorrow. Like I have, a, I have a conference paper that I have to finish, that I have to start and finish uh, tomorrow. So I'm gonna be doing my best to get all that done. Um, but thankfully, the topic of that conference paper is also um, related to what we're doing this class this week with this class. So uh, the ideas are all fresh in my head. Anyway, uh, hope you're all doing okay. It's Monday. Uh, I will be streaming again live on uh, tomorrow on Tuesday, probably talking more about poetry and uh, trying to answer any questions you have. So please answer, please ask me some questions so that I know you're uh, engaging with this work. So um, yeah, I can help you be successful. Okay, well, I'm gonna wrap it up here. Uh, I hope you all are doing okay, and I will see you, or you will see me tomorrow.